So uh, everything that I just told you um, was in one dimension. I did that because it was easier to explain what the weak form is and how to apply boundary conditions in one dimension than it is to do it in three dimensions. And just like doing an example is a lot easier in one dimension. However, I should mention that everything that I just said extends to three dimensions or actually as many dimensions as you want um, very naturally. So, um, and the main idea, remember, but behind the finite element method is the idea of casting your differential equations in terms of the weak form and then applying integration by parts. So in higher dimensions, that trick would be called Green's first identity. So um, for example, um, in, if we're talking about the Laplace equation or like just the Laplace term, the Laplacian of temperature, for example, um, times a weighting function or a test function that I'd like to make sure that you know this overall thing is zero for, um, you can use something that's analogous to integration by parts. So there's a way to basically take this volume integral and break it into a surface integral minus another volume integral that involves uh, like a higher derivative of the weighting function. This is exactly the same. And so look look what I'm doing, right? I'm taking the Laplacian, which is a higher order derivative, and I'm converting it into a lower order derivative um, at the expense of raising the, the number of derivatives that are required for the test function w. That's exactly what we did by, when we were doing integration by parts. So this is what allows us, for example, to use first order polynomials to solve for temperature profiles that are actually parabolas or have some kind of curvature um, to them when we're doing the finite element method. So that whole idea um, still works. There's other things too. So I, I keep talking about piecewise linear polynomials, but that's actually not the only choice. There's So the elements don't actually have to be piecewise linear in the fi finite element method. They just, those, those uh, functions that we're using to do the interpolation, they really just have to form a complete basis so that we can describe any temp temperature profile we want um, to, a, to a reasonably good approximation. So um, they just have to provide a linearly independent de like degrees of freedom so that we, they form a basis for um, approximating the temperature profile. That's all that's really required. Um, and for that reason, there are other ways to do it. So um, actually, it's very common to use quadrilaterals instead of triangles in the finite element method. And the way you do that is like a similar trick. So you, you build up what I'll call basis functions. So like uh, this, like say light blue thing that's here is a basis function that um, is associated only with the node T1. So in a quadrilateral, we've got four corners to our element. And they've got four, so there's four values of temperature that occur, let's say, on the corners of those. Um, I can create, um, I can create basis functions that are non-zero at the node of interest, but zero at the other ones. And it turns out that like generating functions that do that are pretty easy. So this is one that's done in x, y coordinates. So this is actually a two-dimensional quadrilateral. Um, you can imagine like drawing some like a curved polynomial that is zero at the other three nodes and those form a complete basis from which to create a or at least a linear uh, an independent basis with which to approximate any temperature profile that's a function of x and y um, for example um, note that I chose a polynomial so um, if you choose a polynomial um, that means that you can um, either integrate analytically or um, often actually it's possible to use um, Gaussian quadrature. So if you know anything about Gaussian quadrature, you know that Gaussian quadrature provides the exact numerical, um, it, like the, the numerical integral that it gives you is exactly correct up to a high degree for, for polynomials using a relatively small number of sampling points. So um, finite element methods are almost always based on polynomials um, in ter internal interpolations. Just you can use different ones to uh, do different things. Okay, um, 
It doesn't always have to be a polynomial, though. I should mention that there's something called collocation methods, where what they do is, um, so another way to create a linearly independent basis is simply require that the integral um, is correct at the node. So I can choose these w sub x's to be delta functions instead. Um, actually, the uh, anyway, I, I won't go into all the different ways you can do this, but um, there there are ways to like change these methods in like crazy ways that all work. Um, so the other last thing I would say is that you know even though I just showed you how to do all of those things, as a user you don't actually need to know how to do any of this. Um, the reason why you're paying ten thousand dollars for that software is that somebody who's a better coder than you most likely. Um, coded that stuff in already so that you don't have to do the bookkeeping. So Comsol, Abacus, Ansys, MATLAB's PDE tool, um, which actually is what turned into Comsol if you know the history of that company. Um, those things are all finite element methods that have all of this stuff built in for you. Um, you mostly just need to know how to idiot check them. So like verifying your solutions. You need to know how to check against analytic solutions, know what you're expecting to see for the order of magnitude responses, which might come from a scaling analysis or something like that, and understand how to do the mesh refinement to make sure that you understand how you've chosen your mesh and that it gives you an answer that doesn't depend on what mesh you're using. And that's pretty much all you need to know to use a finite element tool, to be honest. So um, I think the next steps are to actually get some hands-on um, experience doing that idiot checking.